that and our panelists, I think, will be offering their reflections on this place in just a moment. Um, this is a superb program. We have the leading election law scholars in the country talking about a topic of central importance in the upcoming election, namely what legal issues might arise from contested elections and how should the courts deal with them. And we have uh, the best moderator in the country to adjudicate that conversation. I'll tell you about him in a moment. But this conversation about the election and the courts is one that will take place throughout the spring and summer here at the National Constitution Center. I do want you all to go downstairs and check out this wonderful new Head of the White House exhibit. Who has seen it so far? Great. It's just so, and everyone who hasn't, go see it. It's so substantive and educational. I learned all sorts of things from it, including the fact that the framers expected most elections to be settled in the House. They did not think that there would be electoral college majorities for most candidates, and they thought that the House would settle elections. In addition to that, it's fun for kids. I think it's a beautiful exhibit. And then we have all of these great programs coming up related to the presidency, including February 25th, Jeff Cowan and David Greenberg on presidential primaries. Uh, we have a great program on uh, policing and technology on March 31st. Uh, Jacob Weisberg is coming in April to discuss his biography of Ronald Reagan. And just, it's going to be all presidency in the Constitution all the time. We're also going to have two really major programs in the spring, one commemorating Justice Scalia's legacy and another speculating about the future of the Supreme Court and the confirmation of that. So, please, and, and then finally, you know, as if that's not uh, enough, I was going to begin to United Sound, but then more. <laughs> just this morning, we recorded a really beautiful podcast about Justice Scalia's legacy with Larry Lessig and Steve Calabresi, both former Justice Scalia clerks. Larry Lessig, the liberal Steve Calabresi, the head of the Federalist Society, they were both so affectionate with their anecdotes and so substantive about his legacy. It's great. It's going to publish tomorrow. If you're not listening to these weekly podcasts, go to iTunes and sign up because they're phenomenal. OK, enough about uh, all the stuff that's coming up. Now let me, uh, oh, one final really important talk. I'm going to end with you. Thank you. Um, who here is a member of the National Conference? OK, that's great. For those of you who are not the small minority, please, we, at the end of today's program, go see Rebecca Bolton. She's standing in back. She will sign you up at whatever level you want. It's just the best way of ensuring you get access to all these programs, notice of all the podcasts, thrilling special events, like uh, uh, great uh, ch chances to see more of me, and incredibly <laughs> 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 enticing uh, thing that you can do become a member, but it's a great way of supporting all of our great programs. And we'd love everyone to be a member. Okay, uh, here are two panelists and our moderator. Uh, Edward Foley, who directs uh, Election Law at Moritz, which is Ohio State Law School's uh, program, and he also holds the Ebersole Chair in Constitutional Law there. He's going to be discussing his new book, Ballot Battles, The History of Disputed Elections in the United States. Can you imagine a more timely topic? It's going to be so great to hear from him. And he's here with Richard Assen, who's Chancellor, Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of California, Irvine, and guru of the most influential and important election law law in the United States, which has the easy to remember title, Election Law of Law. <laughs> follow it regularly online. And he's here to discuss his book, Plutocrats United, Campaign Money and the Supreme Court and the distortion of American elections. And our moderator, Jeremy Fogel, is a great friend of the National Constitution Center. He is the director of the Federal Judicial Center, which is the part of the government that oversees education and research at the federal courts. And with Jeremy, uh, the National Constitution Center has had two spectacular programs educating federal appellate and district judges around the country. We just had one on the history of Reconstruction, Last year it was on Madison's legacy. We're going to do a new one next fall. All of these have public fora and components, which you can come see. And then the judge will be in private to discuss the Constitution. It's just a thrilling event. We're so proud to be Jeremy's partner. He's also been a US district judge for the Northern District of California since 1988. 
He will be taking questions from the audience. You can jot them down on note cards, and uh, our questions are answered. Our panelists will answer them. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Edward Crowley, Rick Hassan, and Judge Jeremy Fogel. Thanks uh, very much, Jeff. Uh, we were all saying uh, there's no way we can possibly live up to that introduction, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. And um, uh, I want to just say what an what a honor and a privilege it is to be working with the National Constitution Center again. And it's a relationship that's been wonderful for the Federal Judicial Center, uh, as well as for all of the people that the NCC uh, serves. Uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, where we started this morning. And, uh, before we get into the uh, books that uh, my two colleagues here have written and what, what they had to say, uh, reflect for just a minute about Justice Scalia, because uh, regardless of where one is on the political spectrum or regardless of one's view of what the courts should do or ought to be, I, I think it's pretty much a consensus that Justice Scalia was an immensely uh, influential and consequential member of the Supreme Court. and. Um, so I'd like to start by just asking each of you uh, if you have a reflection about that. And if you want to tie it to election law, that's great. And if, if not, that's fine, too. So let's start with Professor Foley. Well, thank you. <clears throat> it is great to be here. It's a great honor to be part of this conversation. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Justice Scalia while uh, clerking for Justice Blackmun at the US Supreme Court. And their chambers were adjacent to each other. Uh, and so I would pass him in the hall. And he was always incredibly jovial and friendly. Uh, to everybody in the building. But it, one, one privilege that we had was we got to take other justices to lunch. So the four of us who worked for Justice Blackman took Justice, Justice Scalia for lunch. And the topic ended up being music, because he was this lover of music. And it was during the time where um, the movement to record music on original instruments was really big. So you'd record Bach or Beethoven on original instruments instead of modern instruments. And I just remember how much fun it was talking about that compared to original intended constitutional ah. interpretation and going <laughs> back and forth about were the, was music and the law the same or, or different. And we just had a wonderful time. So I'll always cherish that memory among, among oh, and then the one, so I get back to my, I happened to mention a book that, that talked about um, uh, recordings that you could buy. And I, uh, uh, get back to my desk, I'm working away, and suddenly an email comes in on the system saying, uh, you know, Ned, can you remind me the name of that, that book, Nino? You know, I mean, he was just that um, personable. He just called himself Nino, so I'll cherish that forever. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to talk about uh, these election issues. But let me, I'll say uh, a, a brief word about <clears throat> Justice Scalia and election law. I had just started a project, I was, uh, contemplating a book on Justice Scalia. So I, I've been reading, reading uh, much of his writings. And I think that um, I, I told this to a reporter this morning, there really is no one on the Supreme Court who can replace him in terms of his outsized personality and his, uh, I think, his influence as a public intellectual in a way, putting forward views about the Constitution, views about interpreting statutes that um, whether you agreed with him or you didn't, he was, a, he was a forceful advocate. And it was clear that he was an American patriot, loved the Constitution, loved the country, and, and was pushing things in the direction that he, where he thought things should go. Having said that, um, I would say that Justice Scalia's views on election law were quite troubling to me. And I'll just give a few examples. Uh, although the Supreme Court decided the Citizens United case, which I imagine we'll talk about a little later, which said that corporations have a First Amendment right to spend unlimited sums independently in elections. Justice Scalia was of the view that the First Amendment also allowed individuals to give unlimited contributions directly to candidates. Uh, on the Voting Rights Act, uh, while Justice Scalia was in the majority in the Shelby County versus Holder case, which struck down a key portion of the Voting Rights Act, he was also a justice who believed that the um, other parts of the Voting Rights Act that remained, particularly Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, should be read in a narrow way to not apply to districting questions, which would allow for um, uh, majority voters to be able to completely subsume uh, the, the, the power of minorities in, in an area. And in 
the area of voter identification laws, which is one of the most controversial areas that the Supreme Court considered in a 2007 case called Crawford versus Marion County, while the Supreme Court held that voter identification laws did not violate the Equal Protection Clause, there was a cluster of three justices, uh, led by Justice Stevens, who said that if there were voters who faced particular burdens, they should be exempt from these laws. You think of someone, like a group of homeless voters who would have trouble getting photo identification. Justice Scalia wrote an opinion for three justices, for himself, Justice Alito, and Justice Thomas, who uh, uh, took the position that if most voters would not be burdened by, by a voter ID law, then a voter ID law is just fine, even if there were some voters who would face tremendous burdens. So as we think about the next justice who's going to replace Justice Scalia, when someone says they want another justice like Justice Scalia, I think that would have a lot of uh, implications for our democracy and our elections. And so thinking about his legacy, you can hold the position as I do that he was a great justice, but also a justice who was misguided on certain issues related to law and democracy. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm gonna say something completely nonpartisan. I'm a, I'm a fan of good writing. And uh, Justice Scalia, I think, was a, a great writer. Um, uh, Argle bargle is going to be part of my vocabulary for the rest of my life. That was a phrase he used in, in one of his dissents uh, last year, and uh, I just love that. So I, I will leave it at that. And I, I did have the privilege of meeting him, and, and I share uh, Professor Foley's view. He was an outsized personality and somebody you'd never, never forget having met. <clears throat> So let's get to the business at hand, and uh, uh, you've both written, your books actually touch, touch on uh, different uh, subjects. You, Professor Foley, you talk about disputed elections and, and, and problems with the casting and counting of ballots and what we've done to resolve those issues or not, and Professor Hassan, you've talked about campaign financing in your book and, and, and how that affects democracy, but there's a, there's a common thread, <clears throat> which is uh, the legitimacy of our elections. You both are concerned, ultimately, that we have legitimate elections, that, that people have faith in the process. Um, so, Professor Rowley, why don't we start with you? What, what prompted you to write this book, and what do you think are the main takeaways from the history that you've uh, laid out? Thank you. Um, I actually ended up writing a very different book than planned. Uh, I'm not a historian by training. I'm a law professor, and the assignment that I sort of gave myself was to look around the country at all 50 states, see what the best practices were among the 50 states regarding recounts and the resolution of disputed elections, and glean from those best practices models for the future going forward to how, we, how the 50 states could do better in the future. And starting that work, I, I quickly um, became of the belief that to really do justice to the subject, you had to go back historical. And, and, and as a lawyer, I'm trained only to go back as far as the most recent relevant precedent, right? In a brief, you don't cite a 10-year-old precedent as a 5-year-old precedent that that point will do. Um, but as I probed the subject, I kept going farther back in time all the way to the founding and came away with the conclusion that the difficulty our country had in 2000 with the disputed presidential election and also had back in 1876 with another disputed presidential election and have had with various gubernatorial and US Senate elections, goes back to the founding. Uh, choices made and issues overlooked at the time of our founding that required this to be a history project as, a, as opposed to a 50 state best practice survey. Um, and, and it has to do with legitimacy. And the takeaway is that our, our democracy is evolving and has been evolving since uh, the founding on this issue and others and needs to continue to evolve in the future. It wasn't all there prepackaged at the beginning that we somehow have to just implement what they did. We have to grow our democracy ourselves. Right, but we've really struggled to figure out what, what to do to ensure the legitimacy of the casting and counting of ballots. And because we have a federal system, we have, we have 50 different solutions at least and sometimes more than that. When, when, when within states they give local authorities the, the ability to decide how to how to do ballots, and there've also been, uh, there's been a lot of evolution just in terms of the technology. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even have uh, ballots that were produced by the government for a long time. Right. They, were, they, were, they were created by, by folks on the ground in, in various forms, and I was fascinated. They had all these uh, 
cases where ballots got rejected because the name of a candidate was misspelled uh, <laughs> by the people who made the ballot. You know, it had nothing to do with the, with the voter. Um, but, but I guess, um, do you think we've moved forward in terms of the, uh, the, the things that ought to concern us most deeply? In other words, the, the, the fraud and the, pres uh, the violence, the, uh, the, the kinds of pressures on the process that, that really cast a lot of these early elections into doubt. Yes, so the, the good news takeaway from the history that I looked at is that the 20th century on balance was much better than the 19th century in terms of ha handling these close contested elections. I was really quite surprised to find how many governor elections around the country in the 19th century did end up in violence, bloodshed, real civil strife. And, and the reason was that um, in the 19th century, the legislature of the state retained the power to decide which candidate had won the votes when there was a ballot counting dispute. But the legislature was an institution controlled by one political party. So the losing side always thought that it was rigged, not always, but quite frequently thought that, that, that the election had been stolen by the political party in power. And they didn't want to take that lightly. So they'd sort of form a citizen's militia to fight for control against the, the, the official militia of the government. They, both sides would descend on the state house trying to wrest political power over the, the governor's race. And so you know, we had, here in Pennsylvania in 1838, there was the Buckshot War which I didn't know about, which was a very ugly scenario in which the incumbent governor wanted to seize, um, retain power and, and was willing to manipulate the vote count in his, in his favor. And it was, he ordered the militia to fire on his opponents and the, I guess to the credit of the, the, the general who was in charge of the militia, a guy named Patterson, refused to accept that order. Um, normally, we like to think of the military as obeying the commands of the civilian in control, right? But here, the governor wanted the, the military to shoot uh, political opponents, and he refused to, to do that in the midst of that, that ugly episode. Uh, so that was right, um, you know, right here. Right here. And the other one that, that, that I stood out to me, because I'm a, something of a Civil War buff, was the one in Maine with the... Joshua Chamberlain, you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. so this is in 1879, and, and, and in a way, the exact same pattern, just moved from um, Pennsylvania in the 1830s to Maine in the 1870s, an incumbent, and it was a different political party, but the same desire to control. So you had an incumbent governor wanting to retain power. Um, it involved, again, a, a pretext that the, the, there had been misspelling of the names of the candidates. Uh, and they used that as a kind of a fig leaf to, to, to abuse the counting process in favor of the incumbent party. Um, the, the Supreme Court of Maine actually ordered uh, the incumbent to step down because the other side won, and the incumbent governor refused to obey the judicial decree of the Maine Supreme Court. Um, very similar situation in terms of a, of a general rising to the occasion. Um, uh, Joshua Chamberlain had been a Civil War hero at the Battle of, of Gettysburg, and he had been um, installed as the head of the state militia. And the incumbent governor wanted Chamberlain to do his bidding, and he refused. Uh, he insisted that the Supreme Court have get its way, and the case went back to the Supreme Court for a second opinion. Once again, the Supreme Court of Maine insists that the other party is won and that the governor has to step down. At, at some point, um, troops loyal to the incumbent governor sort of um, accost Chamberlain where he's, you know, residing. And, you know, he, he bears his chest and he says, you know, the Southerners wouldn't kill, you know, didn't kill me. If you, my fellow citizens from Maine, are willing to do it, well, that, I'll be that way. And, and in shame, they, can, you know, they, they withdraw. And so Chamberlain ends up being the hero at the moment. Um, and, and, and ultimately, the rule of law prevails. The, the, the Supreme Court of Maine's decree is enforced, but it was a very dicey moment. Uh, well, there's just a couple other things uh, in the history. I mean, of course, the, the 1876 presidential election, which has gotten a fair bit of attention, that was the, the Hayes-Tilden election. And, and the, I guess the common law history is that, that uh, the votes went to Hayes in exchange for the troops being withdrawn from the South. But uh, you also talked about, uh, I mean, I, this is something I'd never heard about in my entire life, the, the theft of the New York Senate. Um, 
just again, I think it'd be interesting to, for folks to hear a little bit about that, just, just how brazen that, that was. So this, this yeah. was in the 1890s, yeah. a period of hyperpolarization. You know, we live in today's era where the parties are just constantly at each other's. And, and if you go back to the 1880s and 90s, that was another period of intense polarization. And it, and it plays out in these disputes. And in New York uh, State, uh, there, the, the Democrats at the time want to control the governorship and the two branches of the, or two chambers of the state legislature because they really want a political power. And they get the governorship, they get the, uh, the lower house, but they don't get the Senate but they're going to figure out a way to steal the Senate. <laughs> and there are three disputed seats. And, uh, and once again, um, uh, there's some pretext. And they, there's a, a, a kind of an ugly 4-3 split on the, on the highest court of New York, the New York Court of Appeals, over one of these pretextual claims. The other one is so brazen that the Court of Appeals won't go along with it. And, 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 and so, but that, they, the, <laughs> the governor won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, once again, they attempt to defy uh, the, the, the judicial decree that orders them to count the ballots that would mean that they lose this um, critical vote. Uh, here, they're not willing to do so brazenly. So what they, they do is they, they, um, they it's sort of a complicated technical story, but the bottom line is they, they sequester the authentic certificate that uh, would have been counted and forced, and, and they manipulated in, in a kind of nefarious way, and they forced the counting of the, the um, votes that the, the court had asked not to be counted. And they managed to sort of, through stealth of night, steal the one document and replace it with the other mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, when this comes to light, it turns out the deputy attorney general for the state of New York is the one behind this mendacity. Um, and he, he's, he's uh, awarded with a seat on that Court of Appeals, the highest court yeah. of New York, as a result of his, his mendacity. When that all comes to light, New York is outraged in a good story, in a bipartisan way. And ultimately, he, he, um, they hold him in contempt of court. They hold three other people in contempt of court, high, high officials. And, uh, uh, but it's a little too late for that one election. The theft is successful, and only about two years later does it come to light just how awful a story it was. So, so we have a lot of dirty laundry in our, in our electoral history. Uh, I want to ask you about two other things before I, I turn to Professor Hassan. Um, you, you cite a good example, and it kind of goes to your thoughts in the book about how we might fix this problem going forward, and you talk about the, the Minnesota Senate race. And, in 2008. Of course, that was the one where, where Al Franken uh, gave up his job on Saturday Night Live and, and decided, <laughs> decided, decided he wanted to be a senator. So um, you, you point out that that was actually a very uh, positive process, that it had some uh, earmarks that would be things that we'd want to replicate going forward. No, that's exactly right. And, and um, what Minnesota has done this now for two major elections, the 2008 U.S. Senate election that, that Franken did win as a result of the judicial decree. Um, also in 1962, governor's race, where they used essentially the same model. And, and what that model is a three-judge panel specially appointed for the ballot counting dispute. It has one Democrat, one Republican, and one person who's guaranteed to be neutral. And they were able to do this in 2008 because um, Jesse Ventura had been the governor of Minnesota, and he had been an independent candidate, neither Democrat or Republican. And so when they created the three-judge panel for the disputed Senate seat, they, again, they made sure they had one Democratic judge, one Republican judge, and one judge who had been appointed to the bench by Jesse Ventura. So they called it the tripartisan panel, because it, it wasn't just bipartisan. It, it, it came from all three different backgrounds. Uh, and, and that panel ended up being unanimous in its rulings, as did the 1962 court. And it seems, based on this historical analysis, that that's about the best we can do as humanity to come up with a fair tribunal. In other words, a, both candidates want to see somebody on the, on the body that is kind of protecting their interests. So if you're a Democrat, you want to know that there's a Democratic judge on the body. If you're a Republican, you want to know there's a Republican judge. You hope that they're fair-minded judges, but, but 
but your, your team is represented. But ultimately, we need a neutral arbiter and a tie-breaking vote in these mm -hmm. cases. And you propose having something like that more institutionalized, at least at the federal level. Yeah, and, and the f interesting thing, again, going back, in, in, in 1792, there was a dispute for the governor of New York. John Jay was running um, for governor, and it was funny, he was willing to step down from being the first Chief Justice of the United States to run for governor mm -hmm. of New York, which tells you what yeah. the relative yeah. importance of those two jobs <laughs> were at the time. And, uh, and James Kent, a revered figure of American law, um, said, hey, we need a tribunal of this nature. And, and the point was they didn't anticipate these disputes because they didn't know about gubernatorial elections. They, they had never, governors in the colonies were appointed. And, and they didn't know how these high stakes elections would be affected by partisan politics. They had hoped to avoid parties. Mm -hmm. Well, we have parties yep. and we have high stakes elections. We need institutions. 225 years later, we're still trying to figure this out. Yeah. So the last thing I want to ask you before we, we turn to, to Professor Hassan is the, uh, you have an interesting take on Bush versus Gore. Uh, at least it was interesting to me that I hadn't actually ever seen that take before. And, and, and if, correct me if I'm misstating it, but it, you, you actually think that the court did something it needed to do uh, to prevent uh, a, a violation of, of equal protection and due process and that the problem really lay more in how the optics were managed so that it left a, a question of legitimacy. Right, well, I, I think it's important to remember there, there's two components to the Bush versus Gore decision. The first component was the use of the 14th Amendment uh, by the US Supreme Court to say that if state institutions uh, manipulate the counting of ballots in an improper way, that does violate the federal constitution, and then there is a federal remedy for that. And that was actually a seven to two vote, essentially, on the US Supreme Court with um, you know, Justice Breyer and Justice Souter essentially going on. They didn't sign the opinion, but in their own separate dissents, they sort of acknowledged the importance of the 14th Amendment principle at stake. Um, where the court split five to four in a way that's much more controversial and appropriately controversial was having identified the 14th Amendment violation, the remedy of the five justices of the majority was not to permit any further recount, but to basically stop the process and say the time has run out. And I think it's important to distinguish the two elements. And with respect to the first element, I think, you know, looking at the past and trying to project into the future, I think that 14th Amendment holding will have purchase in lots of races all around the country, mayor's races, city council races, to protect the integrity of the process. And in fact, again, I didn't realize this, but, but that seven to two aspect of Bush versus Gore is a vindication of the dissent written in 1900, a century earlier, by the great dissenter John Marshall Harlan. He was the dissenter of Plessy versus Ferguson. And of course, he gets vindicated in Brown versus Board of Education on, on that important Topic. Well, in 1900, he said the, the wrongful manipulation of vote counting is a crime against democracy that the 14th Amendment exists to protect against. And he didn't prevail in that case, but he prevailed 100 years yeah. later in that first element of Bush versus Gore. Okay, well, we'll come back to this, but I want to make sure we uh, hear from Professor Hassan. So you wrote a book about um, campaign finance. And what what motivated you to do that, and what's, what, what is the major takeaway that you have from the work you did? Sure, and w when I was working on the book, uh, one of my colleagues at UC Irvine uh, asked me, uh, who, who is your audience? Which is a great question when you're writing a book. Who are you writing it for? And, and I jokingly said, I'm writing it for Justice Kagan, just for her. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and so let me just explain my thinking. Uh, this uh, year, actually last month, marks the 40th anniversary of a case called Buckley versus Vallejo which is a case that upheld parts and struck down parts of a post-Watergate campaign finance law that the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Congress had passed and that the Supreme Court reviewed uh, in the Buckley case. And Buckley, much more than Citizens United, which has gotten a lot more attention, is a case that has set us on the wrong path in thinking about money and politics now for 40 years. Uh, basically, Buckley sets up a kind of contest for all campaign finance laws between First Amendment rights of free speech and association on the one hand, which are implicated when people want to spend money on elections, and the interest in corruption or the appearance of corruption on the other. 
And corruption can mean lots of things to lots of people, but what the Supreme Court defined corruption to mean is something like bribery or something akin to undue influence. And so for years, the Supreme Court's opinions have moved like a pendulum back and forth between upholding limits and striking down limits as the different justices on the court have viewed the question of corruption. And in Citizens United, which comes in 2010, the Supreme Court says independent spending, even by a corporation, cannot corrupt uh, the political process. And uh, this often gets a laugh from audiences, cannot cause the public to lose confidence in the fairness of the election process. Can I create an appearance? Did here. The appearance of corruption. And so my book is, uh, argues that in Buckley, the court made a fundamental mistake in rejecting a different interest that should be balanced with a very important First Amendment question. And that's the interest in political equality. The court said that trying to balance uh, the First Amendment against political equality was impermissible, that, that trying to level the playing field is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. And the argument I make in my book is that a new Supreme Court, I wrote the last chapter of the book really, uh, it didn't take a genius to see that there was going to be change at the Supreme Court. That when we get a new Supreme Court, if it is a progressive Supreme Court with more Justice Kagan's, that that balance might be struck differently, that the court might recognize that we should not have a democracy in which those with the greatest economic power are able to translate their economic power into political power and that this new balance needs to be considered, and that the whole book is an attempt to justify a new balance that would allow for more limits on money in politics to help assure the kind of one person, one vote views that we hold in other parts of our democracy and put that on the money in politics side. Okay, so, so just in terms of judicial process, and this is it's a question I get all the time when we do public education. So the court says in, in Buckley that political equality is not on the table, doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, from a technical standpoint, that wasn't the holding of the case. The holding of the case was something else. But they kind of dismiss the, the whole notion that political equality matters. And, and to go where you want to go and where you're talking about in your book, the, the, the court would have to say, well, actually, we didn't really mean that or, or that was wrong. You know, and there certainly is uh, precedent for the court making those kinds of acknowledgments. But as we just heard, usually it's like 100 years later. Um, so, so in terms of legitimacy of the court as an institution, <laughs> How do, we, how do we justify doing that? Well, I'd say a few things. First, uh, the court not only said that in Buckley, the court has repeated at least four other times, including in Citizens yeah. United. So it's very well established. Now, there's two ways that the court could go if, if the court accepted my argument. One way is what I would call subterfuge. And the court's already done that. There was a 1990 case called Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, which the Supreme Court ex explicitly overrules in the Citizens United case in which Justice Marshall, writing an opinion for the Supreme Court, said you could limit the ability of corporations to spend money in elections. Maybe you could do it for quid pro quo corruption reasons, but there's what Justice Marshall called a different type of corruption, which he defined as the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth accumulated with the corporate form that have little or no support uh, to, uh, or little correlation to the public support for the corporation's ideas. Those are a lot of words, but what it essentially meant was there's a problem with corporations being able to spend disproportionately uh, in elections when it doesn't reflect public will. That was called corruption, but years later, we finally got uh, Justice Marshall's clerk, who's now the president of Cornell University, Elizabeth Garrett, to admit that Justice Marshall really was trying to sneak in the political equality rationale, but if he had said that, he would have lost his majority, and so he, he, he framed it that way. So I could certainly see a new Supreme Court reviving Austin or, say, or picking up another interest, such as uh, the interest that Dean Robert Post of Yale has talked about, election integrity, or read the word corruption capaciously. So there are many ways that the court can engage in what I would call subterfuge to actually push equality uh, uh, forward without actually saying it. My preferred view is judicial candor and judicial honesty for the court to say, we made a mistake 40 years ago, we repeatedly made a mistake, and now we need to face the difficult question. Do we want to allow uh, the top 100 donors to, a political, uh, to our presidential campaign to spend more than the bottom 2 million donors? That's what we have right now in this election. That is a threat to our democracy. We were wrong 40 years ago, I would, and I think Judicial candor could actually increase the legitimacy of the court rather than hiding behind the subterfuge of pretending that everything, uh, you know, all of the opinions gel together. Well, there's two follow-ups to that. So one of the points you make in your book is that both parties uh, have been complicit. Uh, that it's not just Republicans who get money from 
the Cook brothers, it's, it's Democrats who get money from labor unions, and there's, there's a whole structure of um, the two major parties depending on the current system. So where does the motivation to provide this kind of change come from? Well, I do think that if you look at the current system, there's probably more large money coming on the Republican side, but I expect over time that would somewhat change because uh, Democrats, even though they professed uh, disagreement with Citizens United, are gonna have to play by the rules uh, as they are. So where does it come from? Um, I think what's going to happen uh, is that, uh, you, you know, uh, if you look at the candidacy of Bernie Sanders, and you look at the candidacy of Donald Trump, they may look like they don't have a lot in common, but they have a kind of populism in common, and there is a very much a, uh, a feeling that, uh, that the wealthy have too much influence. Uh, and, and that comes across when Donald Trump says, I'm self-funding my campaign. That comes across when Bernie Sanders, every time he opens his mouth, talks about the corrupt mm -hmm. campaign finances. Mm -hmm. So there's a real resonance, and if we're not looking at the elite level, but we're looking at the level of uh, just the regular population. Democrats, Republicans, and Independents all think that Citizens United is wrong and that our current money and policy system is wrong. So what I, th what I would expect to happen is, uh, if we get a new progressive Supreme Court, there will be the city of Cambridge or the city of Berkeley or the state of California. There'll be some progressive place that will pass some new spending limit. It will get challenged. The case will make its way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will have a chance to open things up. I don't expect we'll get a change tomorrow in Congress, even if the Supreme Court changed. But I could see things working their way up more from the state and local level, from the grassroots, and we actually could see change over the next, if you're thinking about this as a generation, uh, over the next 10 to 20 years, I think we could start to see positive change. One of, the, one of the cases that really interests me on the Supreme Court's stock at this term is the case involving the governor of Virginia, uh, uh, Governor McDonnell, who was convicted of, uh, of corruption. And one of, the, one of the issues that was raised in the petition of the Supreme Court was is, is corruption being defined too uh, broadly. And he was basically the corruption con consisted of giving special treatment to, to a big donor. Um, now that the, I, I'm, it's not clear where that case is going given, given Justice Scalia's passing, but, but what do you think of that? Is that case one of the cases where, where these issues could be teed up? Well, I don't think the, this case will be a case where the court will do much to change corruption, but I do think you're right that Justice Scalia was really a leader on this question. Right? So if you have a private system of public, uh, a, a private system of financing elections where public officials can take uh, large contributions, can benefit from large contributions, and can take gifts, then it creates a, a fundamental uh, problem. And let me point to one of Justice Scalia's older opinions. There's a case called Sun Diamond Growers. It was about the Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Espy, who was getting Super Bowl tickets and all kinds of other goodies from farming interests. And Justice Scalia wrote an opinion and said, oh, that's no problem. It does not violate the illegal, federal illegal gratuity statute because it was not given for any specific official action or as a thank you for any specific official action. So Justice Scalia's absence from the court might leave a 4-4 split over what counts as official action. But I think it raises the broader question of how do we want to finance our elections? And one of the things I argue for in my book is that I would like to move more to public financing so public officials are not so dependent on large donors. And I would actually do it through campaign finance vouchers. Give everybody, every voter, $100 to allocate to political parties, to candidates, to interest groups to be used to fund our elections. It would be collectively billions of dollars, and it would help to swamp the system. And you could actually do it without overturning any cases by empowering the people to be able to fund our elections. That was elections. actually going to be my, my follow-up question, was you could do that without Citizens, Uni Citizens United being overruled. That's right. So the question is, would it be enough? I certainly would prefer it, and I'm very to the current system, and I was glad to see that just this past November, the city of Seattle passed the first voucher plan. We're actually going to see how this works in action. I think it, it combines market ideas with public interest ideas in a very innovative way. Um, leveling up by giving more money is a good thing. I also think we need to level down, so I argue we need to have $25,000 contribution and spending limits together in any election. So if you're the Koch brothers or you're George Soros, to take a, you know, a, a, a villain of the right, uh, who both have put lots of money in elections, once you hit $25,000 contributions or spending together on any one race, you're done. That would take overruling Citizens United, it would take overruling Buckley, I, it's not happening tomorrow, but it could happen next year now, we could say. We'll have to see. Okay. So before we get some audience questions, uh, 
the, this uh, community of election law scholars is actually fairly small. Uh, that you, you are two of the most prominent members, and, and you acknowledge each other's uh, contributions in your, in your books. Uh, so I'm going to ask you kind of a, a question perhaps you didn't expect, but what do, do you have any comment on each other's work? <laughs> watch, um, watch it, Nick. You know, I, I, I think um, Rick's book is fantastic, and I encourage you all yeah. to read it. And, and one of the reasons why is it, it's very nuanced um, in, in ways that we could explore some more. So w one of the points that Rick makes is that one of the reasons why he's um, sort of critical of just amending the Constitution with a, with a new amendment is that there's going to be line drawing problems or line drawing challenges, whatever one's position is with regard to campaign finance. Because even if we overrule Buckley and Citizens United, as Rick says, you have to ask the question, what about media corporations? You know, the, the New York Times, uh, Forbes Magazine, Fox News, and uh, there's lots of chapters in that book that in a very careful, very accessible way explains just what the challenges are for any point of view. And, um, and if I can make one comment about Justice Scalia on this, um, there's a little known Justice Scalia opinion about Amtrak uh, that's relevant to Citizens United because it was, it, the question in the case was whether or not um, Amtrak was part of the government for purposes of the First Amendment. And Justice Scalia, writing for the court, says, yes, of course it is. And strikingly, he says, it doesn't matter that as a matter of formality, Congress set it up as a separate corporation. It functions as a public entity. And therefore, it has to be thought of that way. And if you put that opinion next to Citizens United, you realize Citizens United, for even for conservatives, there's a line drawing question because you know, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is a corporation, but it's also part of the government. It, it doesn't have a right to spend money in elections. The Treasury Department doesn't have the right to spend money in elections. Does a government contractor like Lockheed Martin have a right? And, and I, so I think there's been a lot of overreading of Citizens United because it doesn't apply to all corporations. And Exhibit A is this opinion by Justice Scalia in the Amtrak case. Mm -hmm. Well, Ned and I each blurbed our book, so we're going to say positive things. But I, what, <laughs> what I would say is uh, I, I wrote a book in 2012 called The Voting Wars where I said all the fights about our elections now could trace back to what happened in Florida. You know, all you need to know about what's going on now or look at all the machinations that occurred on both sides and the partisanship and all. Um, and I thought, I thought that was a contribution in terms of uh, showing that things could be traced back to 12 years ago at that point. And uh, what I didn't appreciate until I read Ned's book was how far the history goes back. It doesn't start in 2000, it starts in 1750, I think, mm -hmm. is where mm -hmm. Ned is. And uh, it is very useful. We've made a lot of progress. Uh, we don't resolve our elections with violence. Um, but what, we've made progress, but we haven't made enough progress that we could still end up with something like this. And uh, uh, what, I, uh, what I think is most useful about Ned's book is trying to see over the course of 225 years what's worked and what hasn't worked. And I think he makes a very persuasive case that having neutral rules in advance and having um, people with integrity, this is something you didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, I think very much up here, but it's in the book. Having people with integrity who are willing to have cur cur courage and to do the right thing is the kind of, uh, it, it's a kind of uh, civic virtue that really needs to be recognized and rewarded. And I, I mean, that was one of the big takeaways yeah. I had from your book. Well, the, the, the General Patterson and, and Joshua Chamberlain, you, Governor Everett in, in Massachusetts was uh, the, on the wrong end of a contested election and chose not to contest it. And you even, you even mentioned Al Gore deciding not to prolong the, 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 the Bush versus Gore controversy, sort of examples of what, what Rick was just talking about. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions, and I think they're, they're, they're provocative. Um, so let's get to as many of them as we can. And this one hits close to home because the immediate past chair of the Federal Elections Commission is a very old friend of mine, and I heard from her uh, uh, directly uh, how frustrated she was. But one of, one of the comments is that the the FEC, which oversees the federal election law, has essentially been, been neutered. That, that the, the uh, process of appointing commissioners is, 
endless. Uh, when they get there, it's totally partisan. They can't get anything done. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Uh, oh, since that's a campaign finance one, I'll take yeah, that one yeah, first. Yeah. Um, the Federal Election Commission was created in that same uh, 1974 law that Congress reviewed in the Buckley versus Vallejo case. Uh, it sets up a rule that says that no more than three commissioners can be of the same political party, and there are six commissioners. So that sets up a situation of potential deadlock. And Congress had done this intentionally so that one party couldn't overcome the other. Uh, now, you'd think that would lead to deadlock from the beginning, but it turns out that until about 10 years ago, the FEC was able to regulate elections. There were some things they deadlocked on, but there were lots of opinions that were six to zero, and plenty where there were four to two, and people crossed what you'd expect as the party lines. But what's happened over the last 10 years, since the Roberts Court has come in and has started striking down lots of campaign finance laws as violations of the First Amendment, the Republican commissioners have taken the view that the First Amendment uh, should lead to reading these rules in as limited a way as possible. And so that's why there's been this deadlock. And they say, well, why would President Obama appoint commissioners who believe this? There's been a tradition that says that when the president is of one party, we let the leading Senate, senator from the other side essentially dictate who the nominees will be. And so these are hand-picked Mitch McConnell people. And Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, is an opponent of campaign finance regulation completely. So we have the situation. So it is, it is not functioning now on all of the important questions of disclosure and coordination and super PACs, uh, which groups need to register so that we can get disclosure of donors. Uh, it's been a complete failure, in my view. Um, uh, but that's partly because of the structure and who's been chosen for that commission. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I knew we would get at least one Donald Trump question, so let's get to it right away. So you have somebody who is uh, self-financing and is having, obviously, a very significant impact on the campaign. What, what is the implication of that um, going forward for the things that both of you talk about? Do you do you want to start on that one? Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. What, what lesson can we uh, yeah. take from Donald Trump's self-funding? Well, part of it I've already mentioned, which is that part of his appeal to those uh, people who like him is that um, he's too rich to be bought. Uh, you know, and th there was a, I had a little piece in the New York Times. They did a debate about whether we need uh, Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York, to save us from a Trump-Sanders race, you know, the white knight billionaire to come in. And you know, the story is that Lyndon Johnson, when he was facing, uh, um, coming up for re-election, it was some billionaires, or multi-millionaires at the time, who backed Eugene McCarthy, who basically forced the, uh, Johnson to withdraw from the Democratic primary. Um, I would rather have the people fund that, rather than some billionaire white knight. And so, uh, you know, what does it tell us? That the one candidate who's not backed by billionaires on the Republican side is a billionaire himself? I think it still tells us that money in politics is very, very important. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that I worry most about the phenomenon of, of Donald Trump, and, and, and I wouldn't say just him, is that I can't remember a recent election cycle where it seems like the concept of sort of fair play and sort of being within, that we're all in this together seems to be so frayed. I mean, I appreciate, Rick, your point about the, the importance of civic virtue is, is a lesson of the, of the book in the sense that even if we members of a, of a party, we are also in a common enterprise uh, of our democracy. And, and the system doesn't work unless there is a sense of that commonness, I mean, and that, 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 that elections are legitimate contests to see who's going to temporarily be custodians of the government's trust for a certain period, and then another, we'll have another election and see who's going to be the custodians. And, and it seems like the, um, the level of anger and vitriol is so high, people are, are sort of are, are willing to say it's OK to break the rules or just to destroy the system as opposed to play within the system. And well, I, it, I worry and, about and that. And another thing that, that, just to throw this in, it seems to me that, that social media has had an effect that doesn't get enough uh, attention on, on this point that you both made about, about civility and, and respect for the process. Because people can, can react immediately uh, without, without editing, without filtering, without even worrying about what someone else is going to say. And the candidates do it, too. So it creates a, an environment where stuff is a lot more out in the open than it, than it has ever been before. I think that's true, although I, I think the, 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 
concern that I have is not the not the means of communication, but the substance yeah, of the yeah. communication. I mean, I mean, I think again, I think there have been periods of time. You know, there were some very vitriolic pamphlets back in the old right. days, <laughs> using that technology, and, um, and 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 Twitter can be used for good as well as right. for ill. One lesson that I had not anticipated that came out of a a, a Virginia disputed election of of for a attorney general's race in, in 2013 was that Twitter was actually used as a medium of transparency so that you had folks looking at the vote voting process and the and if there was a, a mistake um, that could be quickly corrected by tweeting a, about it yeah um, I, I actually followed that and it was it was says something about me I guess but I mean I was I was I was fascinated by that 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 you were down to like single single votes you know we're getting that kind of Review that kind of transparency, and transparency yeah. is a good thing. So I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I think the, and I think other aspects. I mean, I think technology, for example, could be used as a, a positive uh, in the campaign finance arena. Just, just like vouchers would be valuable, we might be able to use new, um, innovative forms of, of internet technology to expand um, the public space of, of campaign discourse that isn't funded by private, private money. Mm -hmm. So. I'm agnostic on technology. I'm, I'm more worried about the cultural forces. Right. So uh, another question, and this seems germane too. I mean, you know, we have this electoral college system, which, like a lot of things, is you know uh, reflected the reality back in the in the 18th century. Uh, one of the people here is asking, should we get rid of it? Should we just have a popular election for president? And would that would that advance the goals of legitimacy that, that both of you are talking about? Short answer, in my own view, is yes, but the, the most striking thing that I learned in the history inquiry that I did for this book was I discovered, I mean, I, I, other people knew about them, but I didn't know about them before. James Madison wrote some fascinating letters in the 1820s. When, you know, when I think of James Madison, I think of him you know, here in Philadelphia at the moment of the founding in 1787 in that summer at the convention. And that's an important part of his life, important part of our country's life. But he lived on beyond Philadelphia in 1787. He had been president of the United States. And reflecting back on his life and his work in the 1820s, he wrote to some friends, he said, we blew it back in Philadelphia on the design of the Electoral College. And he wrote to his friend, George Hay, an amendment that he wanted adopted to replace the Electoral College with a much more democratic um, uh, version. It, it didn't get adopted, but, but, but what was striking, he said, he said, the reason why we were mistaken that summer in Philadelphia is we got to the issue of presidential elections late in the summer, and we were tired mm -hmm. <laughs> and impatient and wanted to go home. <laughs> and it's, you know, we're just human. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he, he actually forecasted the problem of the Hayes-Tilden election. He, he said, I'm, because he had lived through congressional disputes and so forth. So in 1826, he writes another letter of he says, I'm really worried if we ever get a disputed presidential election, because the stakes are so high, and there will be arguments on both sides, plausible arguments, we don't have the institution to handle yeah. that. So I think we should remember our founders, but we shouldn't do that as a snapshot just one moment we should realize that they learned from experience and that Madison in the 1820s was not the same person as Madison in One the One of the points you make in your book is, you know, we had Hayes Tilden and we had Bush Gore, but there were about three or four other near misses. That if one, st in fact, uh, the one that I remember that it really, I think, kind of was below the radar was 2004. That uh, that was uh, uh, Bush uh, uh, Kerry, that, that if Ohio had gone the other way, Kerry would be president. And, uh, and, and there were some disputed votes in Ohio. That's your, your, your home. You're right. Well, that's where they, <laughs> yeah. that, that was yeah. partly the genesis of why yeah. I started the yeah. project about because I because yeah. 2004 wasn't wasn't near near miss. If if Ohio had been in as close in 2004 as it was in in, in 1976, Carter beats Ford by about 10,000 votes. If 2004 had been 10,000 votes in Ohio instead of 100,000 votes. 2004 would have been as messy as 2000. So we really escaped, uh, you know, another another close call. And and we might, you know, it's going to happen at some point, whether it happens next year or, or next time. On, but it's it's like earthquakes in yeah, California. Yeah, they they there's going to be one. Yeah. So so last question. Um, and uh, you know, 
heard, I was in uh, Canada a few years ago during their um, parliamentary election, and they have uh, strict limits on, on how long you can campaign. I mean, there's a, there's a fixed campaign season, uh, and, and any campaigning outside of season is, is prohibited. So I want to combine a couple questions we got from the audience. One was, should there be a national primary, you know, instead of this sort of slow drip of primaries that we have starting in, in January? And, and secondly, should there be and could there be under the Constitution some limit on uh, the length of the campaign season for, for the presidency? Well, let me take the first and yeah. I'll let you take yeah. the okay. second. Yeah. Um, I think our primary system is chaotic and uh, kind of a mess and nothing that anybody really, no single person designed. So I would, I would change it if, if I could. I'm not sure one primary day would be a good idea. I, I, think, I think it is important to have a, a season where the electorate as a whole gets to know the candidates and, 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 and there, there, there's a winnowing process. I think, if, I think it would be too hard on challengers and, and, and upstart candidates just to have, to have one national primary day. Um, but that isn't to say that we should have the system that we have now with the sort of unrepresentative states going first kind of thing. I, some people have suggested five primary day, you know, 10 states on five different days, spaced out, large states, small states, and an appropriate sequencing. Some rationality would be good. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think um, it would be workable to have time periods in the United States. Uh, in part because drawing that line between what's election speech and what's not. We're in a permanent campaign in this country. And part of the reason we're in a permanent campaign, and it's worth contrasting with Canada, is we have a highly polarized system, and they have a somewhat polarized system in Canada, too. The parties mean very different things. But we have a polarized system and separation of powers. And so we have, pres we have a president of one party, we have a congress of another party. It's easy to blame the other. And so there's a constant kind of turmoil. And if we had a parliamentary system, I'm not advocating that we mm -hmm. move to a parliament, that would be a huge change. If we have a parliamentary system, at least you could, you know, the Democrats could enact their, their policy, we could see if we like it, and you vote them out or keep them. Uh, here, everyone can blame the other, and we end up with stalemate. And so uh, that's part of the reason we have the permanent campaign, is that there's always this kind of churn. And it, uh, I think it's one of the features of our constitutional design that if there were a way to overcome the inertia, we should do it. But it's hard to see how to do that without having winners and losers, which makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. So th there's just the, the task of g getting to a situation where we had a fixed campaign season is just probably more than we can handle under our current uh, system of government. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're out of time. Um, and what I'd like to do uh, is thank both of these wonderful scholars for their contributions and, and uh, you for your questions, and I hope it was a worthwhile hour. Thanks very much. <laughs>